Welcome to St. John's Church, our online worship on this, the second Sunday of Easter. We are grateful to have you with us today. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord Lord is is risen risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. A collect for the second Sunday of Easter. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson is a reading of Psalms 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. There he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, <clears throat> We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, Lord Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your psalms today and in the weeks to come, may we be filled with the wonder of your word, and may we be renewed as your sons and daughters to speak truth for your glory, and in the honor of your Son. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, this Easter season, we are going to break uh, with tradition, and we are going to focus our preaching uh, in a series on the book of the Psalms. Now, we did something kind of like this during Lent when we focused on the Old Testament readings from the lectionary, uh, and we did that to show how Christ's life and death was the culmination of of what God had been doing in the world and through his people from the very beginning of time. It culminated in the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. But this time, uh, we're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to, uh, instead of following the Psalms that have been appointed by the lectionary, we have handpicked uh, a representative sample, if you will, a selection of Psalms as a means of introduction to all of the the major topics and emotions and things that are covered by the Psalms and that the Psalms have to offer to us. Now, the question that you might be asking is why would we do this? Why would we study the Psalms this Easter season? Well, it's because we believe that the resurrection of Jesus is, uh, in essence, his coronation as our king. Right? It's when we are once again brought under his direct care and his direct provision through a renewed relationship which is made possible by the cross and by the empty tomb. And so we have this new means of communication that has been restored between us and between our king. And that's what God desires, right? Our primary means of communicating with him is through his word and then through our word, through scripture and through prayer. And that's exactly as he designed it to be. He's not in the, the, the robot business, the gospel robot that just uh, reiterates and does what, what he says. No, he wants to speak truth into our hearts, and then he wants to, 
to listen and wonder and in glory as we speak that truth back to him. It's, it's not unlike when a, a student finally gets what the teacher is trying to say and is able to, to say it back using his own words. And she just, just smiles. And the joy of the moment of seeing her student learn. And that's what God desires for us. Not a monologue, but a dialogue. That we would speak and listen, and that he would speak and listen. And so we turn to the Psalms. The Psalms are, in a lot of ways, the prayer book of Scripture. They teach us how to pray. They teach us how to dialogue with the creator of the universe, with the savior of our souls. And, and let's be honest, prayer can feel kind of awkward sometimes, right? It's, it's really, it's not unlike the stage fright that can, that can come upon us when we encounter someone that we admire, you know, with a whether it's fear or the wonder or something else, we're, we're overwhelmed by the moment and we lose the ability to speak, right? All we can eke out is in our prayer to God is thank you for this or, or sorry for that. And it feels awkward and it feels strange. We just don't know if we're doing it right. But as the Psalms will show us, there's, there's much more to prayer than, than that. Eugene Peterson wrote this. He said, Untutored, we tend to think that prayer is what good people do when they are doing their best. It is not. He says, Inexperienced, we suppose that there must be an insider language that must be acquired before God takes us seriously in our prayer. There is not. Prayer is elemental, not advanced language. It is the means by which our language becomes honest and true and personal in response to God. He, he ends with, with this. He says, It is the means by which we get everything in our lives out in the open before God. And we see that in the Psalms. We see trust and confidence. We see wonder and assurance. But, but we also see fear and despair and anger and all those emotions and thoughts and feelings that are wrapped up in the human heart. The Psalms teach us how to communicate to God as members of his kingdom, as heirs of his rich estate, these things that we experience and that we feel. To put it another way, they, they teach us how we are to respond to God and to what God has done on our behalf. So I want to show you today that I'm not making this up. Uh, we're going to take a look at Psalms 1 and 2. Psalms 1 and 2 introduce us to the main themes of the book of Psalms. And we see, and I use borrowed words here, we see from Psalms 1 and 2 that the life of holiness and happiness is found under the reign of the divine king and his Messiah. So follow along, open up your Bibles, uh, pick up the scriptures. We're in Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms. We're looking at Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. And the first question that we want to seek to answer today is how can we experience a life of holiness and happiness? If this is what God has promised to us, how do we experience it? We'll look right at the very beginning of Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man. It's a declaration. It's a, a statement. It says, happy are those. It's possible. And he's going to give us provisions against certain behavior and, and for other behavior. First, against certain behavior. He says, happy are those who do not. Look at verse 1 with me. Walk, stand, sit. In the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners, or the seat of scoffers. Now the psalmist is using parallelism. He's, he's restating the same thing in different ways to emphasize the point that he's trying to make. But there's also a progression to it. Walk, stand, sit. There's this movement that, that indicates progression. The psalmist is saying, blessed is the one who avoids going down the road of unrighteousness by seeking out in thought or in action the influence of these bad actors, these unrighteous people, these wicked scoffers and sinners. Instead, he says in verse 2, instead, happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. The law of the, war, of the Lord. The law being used here in its broadest sense to mean the, the instruction of God, not just the 
the narrow rules of the Mosaic law, but the, the more general instruction of God. Day and night, the psalmist says, day and night, we are to meditate on these things, an emphasis of this sort of continual state. The psalmist is saying, blessed is the one who finds his joy in the instruction of the Lord and ponders it continually. Well, what's the result of this? We see in verses 3 and 4, the comparison and contrast of two different images. The first image in verse 3, one of worth and of permanence. The righteous are like a firmly rooted tree that draws on the source of life for its health and its vitality. Again, we get a sense of strength and of worth and of permanence. But in verse 4, that image is contrasted with one of, of worthlessness and of impermanence. The psalmist says that the unrighteous are like the worthless husk that is blown away. And as one biblical expert says, without root below, without fruit above, devoid of all the vigor and freshness of life, lying loose upon the threshing floor and a prey of the slightest breeze, thus utterly worthless and unstable. That is the life of the unrighteous person. So in verse 5 and 6, the psalmist reaches his conclusion. Verse 5, he uses that parallelism again. One verse, two halves, stated two different ways, but the same meaning to be found in both. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. He's saying at the judgment, God will separate outwardly what is now already separate inwardly. The unrighteous will be cast aside, blown away, discarded. How, though, will this take place? How is it that God will know the righteous from the, from the unrighteous? Verse 6 gives us our answer. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows. He knows the way of the righteous. This is not a superficial sort of knows about in a general sense. It's not an intellectual he has knowledge of. This is a, a deeply intimate and a personal knowledge. This word is used elsewhere throughout uh, Scripture, and, and I want to give you a couple examples so you understand what's, what's being said when, when the psalmist writes that God would know the way of the righteous. Psalm 31 I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Or the prophet Nahum, who says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. This is an intimate and a personal knowledge that God has of his righteous ones. We return to the, to the biblical experts. What is intended is a knowledge which is in living in intimate relationship to its subject and at the same time is inclined to it and bound to it by love. This is, this is not unlike the love and the knowledge that is experienced between a husband and a wife. It's an intimate and a deep and a personal knowledge. Through this personal knowledge, of the righteous, God provides an everlasting protection. And Psalm 2 shows us that this intimate knowledge, this everlasting protection, comes through his anointed son, Jesus. I'm just going to briefly go over Psalm 2. You'll notice Psalm 2 has three characters, the kings of the earth, God in the heavens, and then the anointed son. And the psalm is broken into four different parts. First, you have the kings of the earth that rebel in verses 1 through 3. And then you have God in the heavens responds to their rebellion in verses 4 through 6. And then you have the anointed son who also responds in verses 7 through 9. And then finally, in the last three verses, the kings of the earth are warned. Now, after the kings of the earth rebel against God in these first few verses between, against God and his anointed, God in the heavens responds, first by laughing at them, as it says in verse 4. 
And then in verse 6, he speaks, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, Zion being another word for Jerusalem, my holy hill. You see, God's confidence rests entirely in the power and in the authority of his appointed king to deal with the rebellion of these earthly authorities. And then that anointed king responds himself in verses 7 through 9. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. See, friends, it's in the resurrection of the anointed Son, Jesus Christ, that the rebellion is defeated. The enemies of God are robbed of their power. And so the psalm gives a final warning to these kings of the earth. In verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Blessed are, happy is the one, as Psalm 1 verse 1 says, who take refuge in him. This, friends, is how, according to Psalms 1 and 2, we can experience the life of holiness and happiness. It's by taking refuge in him, by orienting our hearts to him and to his instruction, like a, like a flower moves with the sun to soak up every possible advantage of its rays. Trusting that as as the hands follow the head when riding a bike, so will our thoughts and our actions follow when our hearts remain oriented towards God. I'll end with one final quote, and this is my prayer for us as we walk through this series on the Psalms in these Easter weeks. One theologian says, The book of Psalms gives us one of the most complete and comprehensive revelations of the character of God in the entire Bible. If we want to know who God is, what he has done, and how we should respond to him, the book of Psalms is one of the best places to start. Friends, this Easter season, as life begins to return to normal, as hope is restored, that things will go back to how they once were, it's my prayer that we would recommit ourselves to know who God is, to know what he has done, and to know how we should respond to him. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Let us pray for the church and for the world. <clears throat> Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Myers Irvin, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care and keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, health care workers, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. And we pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Cott, Matt Harvey, Bridge Jernigan, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, John Taff, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, and Peter Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Archbishop Foley Beach and Bishop Mark Lawrence, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Peter Bike, Sam Dinsmore, Joanne Fisher, Lee Gary, Chris Gasper, Christopher Grover, Libby Hazelton, Peggy Kinney, Billy McCrary, Patrick McDougal, Paula Schofield, Asa Skinner, Debbie Watson, and Danny Yarborough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We, rem we remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifest sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us, we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, 
forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all who travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. God's peace. peace. Well, welcome again to St. John's Church. We're glad to have you uh, with us in worship today online. Uh, we had a great Easter Sunday last week, and I, I just want to say thank you to all who came out and were a part of that or who helped, who helped put it together from the, uh, the Easter egg hunt to the reception that we had uh, to, to decorating the church and making it look so beautiful. Uh, it took a lot of people to help make that happen, and we had a great celebration uh, of, uh, of worship on Easter Sunday this past week. And so thank you to all who could participate in that with us. And we've had a bit of a slow week this week. Ken is away taking some time off and he'll um, be back with us next week. Uh, we've got a few announcements for you. Uh, first, uh, Meals on Wheels. It's St. John's week again to serve with Meals on Wheels and to deliver meals throughout our community. Um, that week is coming up on April 26th through the 30th. So if you are interested in helping out um, with that ministry, you can get in touch with Craig McKenzie. He is our contact. Um, uh, he's a member of our church and, and serves with Meals on Wheels and coordinates our week for us. So you can get in touch with him. If you need his number, uh, you can call the church office and we'll be glad to get you in touch with him. Uh, it's a great opportunity to serve our neighbors uh, in our community. So I encourage you, if you're able, to, uh, to volunteer for that. Again, this April 26th through the 30th. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries that need to be recognized and celebrated this week. We want to say happy birthday to Sue Hopewell and to Marion Hunter. And we want to say a happy anniversary to Shirley and Harry Greenleaf and to Courtney and Patrick Sullivan. Again, thank you for being in worship with us today. Our service will continue with our concluding prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. I ask that you would join us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful Father, send down upon the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina your heavenly blessing. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that in the election of a bishop coadjutor, we might conduct our work in love and faith and in purity of heart. We pray that you would send to us a shepherd of your own choosing, a faithful servant of your gospel to hold up the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, and seek the lost. We ask all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now together we offer the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, 
give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.